Amen. Hallelujah. Psalms 116 and verse 15, something that is contrary to how not only we feel, but live a lot of times. Death bothers us. Death scares some people. Death is, death is something to do all we can to avoid. From diets to how we drive to so many things influence the fact that, you know, I'm, I don't want an early exit. <laughs> Can I say that? Now, I want to be out of here on time. I don't want to be late, but I don't want to be too early. <laughs> I'll come early for prayer. I'll come early to church. But I want to make sure I'm doing everything I can while I can until I have to go. In all honesty, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read more of this chapter, but it would behoove you to get an understanding, to read read the entire chapter and take note of some of the things that David is, is writing here. But I do want to pull from verse 15. Precious, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. That word precious literally means valuable. Prized, weighty, rare, splendid, costly, highly valued. I want to speak for a few moments on death is swallowed up. It's really, it's really difficult when we're so earthly bound to get a good concept of this ideology that the Lord gives us. It's when the, when the rich young ruler came face to face with Jesus and was given what he needed to have eternal life with all his knowledge of scripture, with all that he had done, he was unable to let go of the God that supplied all of it. We have to be careful when we think we're ready that we have things that tie us and we become so earthly bound that we're not heavenly ready. Jesus, we love you tonight. We praise you, Lord. I need your help. This subject is beyond the mortal me, and I ask for the help for your spirit and your unction to help me speak to your people, those online, and especially those that have taken the time to come and be in the building to be a part of the body of Christ tonight. Help us, Lord. Do a great work in our hearts and our lives, and especially our spirits tonight. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. You know, when death meets life is contrary to to how we are bound in our, in our physical sense. But God is planning a great reunion of his saints or his body, if you understand the typology we're given in Scripture. First Thessalonians chapter 4 tells us that the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then when we, then we which are alive and, and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Is a, that's one of the greatest word pictures we get to understand that precious moment, that, that amazing thing, that, that, that moment that is a picture of the moment that the first raindrops hit the top of the ark, uh, the, the moment that the, uh, the death angel went over uh, Egypt and that blood on the doorpost. Uh, you have to understand there's amazing moments throughout our history, and they're not the Super Bowls. They're not the World Series. Uh, they're not when you get the job, or I hate to the physical, when you have the baby, or you have an anniversary, but it's that moment when you're right with God and you depart to be with him. 
Jesus went on to say in John chapter 14, in my father's house are many mansions. Uh, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. God has promised us that there's more to this life than what happens on this earth. We are more than meat and drink. We, we are more than just uh, the job that you work or the successes or failures that you experienced. Uh, and to be so caught up in, in all the things and the tapestries that we've made this life, uh, oh, that we don't get caught up in such things. Uh, Second Peter reminds us that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us. Us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Uh, precious is death, uh, but perishing. You don't like that one. He would all uh, would that all would come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned everything in this life, everything in the, everything you've built, everything that you hold, that little home you're going to go back to tonight, that, that car, that, that life insurance, that, 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 that car, all that stuff, not only will go away, but the context is will mean nothing. In that moment, in that twinkling, all that the world has told you to make it mean so much about who you are will mean nothing. Matthew goes on and, 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 and writes in chapter 10, verse 20, and fear not them which kill the body. Oh, that means a whole lot right now. Everybody running around with masks and all this vaccine and quarantine and all. Uh, it still says we ought to obey God rather than man. It's funny how, how quickly in just a matter of short time that it's safe to go to Walmart but not to church. Oh, you're in quarantine, but you can go to the grocery store but not to church. Oh, you... Oh, you, you, you Say that again. I, I, I see y'all like, well, Pastor, you don't know. Yeah, I do. I, I, I live too. I get the glares for not wearing a mask in certain I, I, you know, and I fall into 1%. Fear not them which kill the body, but are able to kill the soul but not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him, which is able to store both soul and body in hell. There's a lack of fear of the Lord today. There is a place where the Bible says, God looks unto those that trembleth, those of a poor, contrite heart that trembleth at his word. I almost preached that tonight. When's the last time you trembled at his word? I promise you, you sit down in a doctor's office and he starts saying the word cancer, there's going to be a trembling coming on you. You're going to fear cancer. It's a sad day we fear cancer greater than we fear the Lord. It's a sad day we fear a virus, but we don't fear the Lord. Because you understand, when you're dead, the virus, the cancer don't mean nothing because now you're face to face with eternity. Are oh, you hear what I'm saying? That's why Luke tells us in chapter 13, strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house has risen up and I shut the door, remember when the ark's door was shut, that was it. And he began to stand without and to knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he shall answer and say to you, I know you not when she are. Then shall ye begin to say, we have eaten and drunk in thy presence. Yeah, many people have. And thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not when she are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. Iniquity is lawlessness. We live in a church age today. You got a church on every corner. We got this belief and that belief and all the subcultures of all the little clubs and all the little things you belong. And, and, and all that, I'm not going to say a word against, but what good is, it, good is it to be a part of this club and that club and you got this group of friends and that group of, and you're lost. 
There's a bunch of things that'll occupy and take up your time, but eternity's coming, and that's a long time. What if you really secured? But I want to I want to read read further. I want you to listen to this because it references eternity right at the end here. Are you hearing me, Luke? This is uh, uh, 13, 24 through 28. All you words, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Isn't it funny people do that towards the church today? They gnash at it. When you shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. That's pretty clear. Some ain't going to make it. That's pretty clear there's going to be an amazing time of, of the body of Christ and, and those that made it in the Old Testament, and those that made it in the New Testament, all the saints in heaven. This is going to be an amazing time of worship and praise, and heaven's going to be glorious. And those that are thrust out. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Life and death. But I want to take my key text tonight, and I'm going to read you out of Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 15, because it's an important thing that happens here. And I want you to realize that wherever you're at, we are all dead in trespasses and sins, and it's up to the Lord to bring life. That's right. You're dead in trespasses and sins. If you don't repent, you're baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of sins and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, you're dead in trespasses and sins. Are oh, you hearing what I'm saying? And it came to pass that day after that he went into a city called Nain. And many of his disciples went with him and much people. So you got a crowd of people with Jesus. Now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out. The only son of his mother and she was a widow and much people of the city was with her. So there's a great crowd coming in and a great crowd coming out. Both doing two different things. Mm -hmm. And the Lord saw her. And the Bible says he had compassion on her and said unto her, weep not. Everything's dead in my life and you're telling me not to weep? The Bible says and he came and he touched the beer. That's the thing that the young man's body laid on. And they that bear him stood still, and he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. Hey, that's, that's a funeral right there. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that, that's, that, that's quite a funeral right there. That, you know, that all of a sudden, all the hors d'oeuvres and all the potato salad and the little cups and the little fountain they had over here and the punch bowl over there and the little tater tots or whatever they had that it went it went from a funeral to a celebration you know all of a sudden that old guy in that stuffy old suit didn't know man leave all of a sudden he'd take that tie off walk over there and get too much salmon or whatever no thank god we can morning turn into dancing Thank God for the celebration that Jesus brings into a situation. It looks over. It looks dead. It looks done. But when Jesus walks in, when, when Jesus steps on the scene, uh, if you'll let him, he'll turn it around. He'll turn it upside down. He'll take a funeral cake and make a celebration cake. He'll take, he'll take a time of mourning and turn it to a time of dancing. That's what Jesus does. That's what happens when death comes face to face. With the giver of life. In fact, this 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 chapter in John is 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 there's an amazing chapter. It says, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You see, throughout scripture, Jesus did things to the centurion, he gave the word. To the widow of name, he was the word. To John the Baptist, he sent the word. Funerals are uncomfortable affairs. I've done a few of them. I've attended a lot of them. And humanity has done the best it could do to make them better over the years. You know, the dead are placed in a 
basically a wooden box, but today they cover it with special colors and veneers and, you know. But by all points, it's still a wooden box lowered by ropes into a newly dug dirt hole. But today it is a far more elegant affair. When you die, they find a building, church or mortuary, otherwise, whatever. It's got manicured lawns, decorated pathways, and you walk in and there's pleasant music being played. Gone to great lengths to make sure that there's a tasteful presentation of the dearly departed. In fact, there's professional makeup artists today that can make, well, make you look better in death than you did in life. And you lay in that, your body's laid in that beautiful soft bed, with silk or satin, and people that didn't have time to come see you for holidays come from all over the place to see you and just to see you. Say all kinds of nice things about you. They'll stand in line to honor you. At the ceremony, the pastor will stand in front of you and speak of the great things you've done in your life. All the lives that you've touched and all the good that you've done. When the ceremony is over, you'll get to ride in a nice polished limousine down the streets where those gentlemen in those marked cars with the red and blue lights that you used to avoid now honor and stop traffic so that you can finally run all the red lights you didn't, you couldn't when you was alive. And you can do it without getting a ticket. Cars with people you never knew will stop and pull over just because you're coming. When you arrive at the cemetery, you are cautiously placed over the hole in the ground and surrounded by a beautiful array of flowers. There's beautiful green astral turf that's laid just perfect to hide the hole of dirt. And finally, after the last song, the last poem, the last words are spoken over you, the funeral director will nonchalantly and discreetly push a lever instead of men with ropes lowering you, you will delicately be lowered into the grave to be buried. It's elegant. It's made as beautiful as possible. It's pretty impressive. But you know, when it's all said and done, dead is dead. I don't want to rain on your funeral. But one of the harsh truths of life is this, dead is still dead. When you look around this room, every one of us is going to experience that. You will die. I will die. We have an appointment, each and every one of us. I don't know what your appointment clock looks like. I don't know how long you have, how long I have. It's something I think about. I know you young people, it's maybe the only context which you think about it is that I don't want the Lord come before I get married or whatever it is. Or well, don't come before I learn how to drive. <laughs> it, it, it's funny, the things that captivate us and, 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 and we think are so important over being prepared for that final moment. Your friends and your family, your neighbors, everybody you know are going to die sooner or later. And that's, of course, like I read, Jesus comes first. But nevertheless, none of us gets out of this state, this body alive. Psalms 49 tells us, for he seeth that wise men die. Likewise, the fool and the brutish person perish and leave their wealth to others. The inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever and their dwelling places to all generations. They, they call their lands after their own names. And nevertheless, man being in honor abideth not. He is like the beast that perish. This 
Their way is their folly. Yet their prosperity approved their sayings. There's weight behind it because they think they've accomplished something. And like sheep, they are laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them. And the upright shall have dominion over them in the morning. And their beauty shall consume in the grave of their dwelling. One version says it this way. All can see that wise men die. The foolish and the senseless alike. They perish, leave their wealth to others. Their graves shall remain. Their houses forever. Their dwellings for endless generations, even though they had named lands after themselves. But mankind, despite his riches, does not endure. Doesn't matter how clever you are, how wealthy, doesn't matter how popular or famous you've become, doesn't matter how important people think you are right now, doesn't matter how many people you know that seem important. Doesn't matter how much we want to have a say, everybody dies. And so it figures at least once in his ministry, we find Jesus encountering a funeral. Why not? Is that a wedding? He's been at many other events. So we find Jesus encountering a funeral procession. Now, there are those who believe that Jesus met this funeral on purpose, that Jesus had planned to be there for a specific purpose of raising this young man from the dead. In fact, there's little, and I agree, that Jesus did in the Gospels that was a coincidence. I can see that many times in the Bible stories that we find in the Gospels, when Jesus met the woman at the well, I, that, that was planned. He, he knew where he was going. He knew he was going to go meet and what time she was going to be there. And that's why he went when he went for the purpose that he went there for. It was specific. And he waited just for her. And when Jesus walked through the city of Jericho, it seems obvious that he was looking and waiting to find that tax collector that would climb that tree because life was not going to afford him anything because people didn't like that little grindy, little malicious, little swindler man. And I believe there are many Bible stories where Jesus had planned to meet certain people for certain reasons, and I like that. Jesus is the perfect example of purpose. But this story about the widow of Nain opens up the possibility that it's not one of those stories. And if you'll allow me a little license tonight, this might be a moment that's not exactly planned out. It, it, if you read it, it doesn't feel like a deliberate encounter. There's some phraseology in here that can be looked at. A phrase that Luke uses to describe Jesus' reaction to this widow's grief seems to be completely spontaneous and heartfelt. Otherwise, he would have had to fake this, and I just don't see that about Jesus. I don't believe that you're here tonight and he's walking up and down these aisles touching hearts and minds that if something happened to you and you, you allowed him to see the true pain and hurt that you have and the things that you're going through, that he would not be touched by the feelings of your infirmities. And so when he saw this lady weeping, the Bible says, and when he saw her, he had compassion on her and said under her, weep not. I don't know. There is something about a lady crying that affects a gentleman. I believe that when he saw her, his heart went out to her. That word used in the Greek here is one of the most in, intense that could be used for this emotion. It, it, King James says he had compassion on her, but even that phrase doesn't quite capture the depth of Jesus' feelings at this point. The biblical translation called The Message, which reads more like a novella, states it this way. When Jesus saw her, his heart broke. Jesus literally hurt for her. His grief was intertwined with hers. Her loss affected him. And he was affected by the brokenness that she felt. Hebrews reminds us in chapter 4, verse 15, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He was touched in the very depths of his heart by her tears, by her pain, by, by her loss, by the grief, by the struggle, by, 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 by what the future might hold. But what was it about this woman that would have moved Jesus in such a powerful way? 
gospel for? What, what, what do we know? What, what are we given? We know she just lost her son, her only son. Now that would be a, a tragedy. And all the mothers say amen right now. That would be tragedy enough for any woman. But, but Luke makes a point of telling us this wasn't the only sadness and loss she experienced. Verse 12, it tells us, that a dead person was being carried out, and it says the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. Oh, wait a minute. She lost her only son, and she was a widow. So she had previously lost a husband, and now she has also lost her only son. That doesn't really touch us where it should, because... Even though emotionally that's devastating, her tears were tears of a woman who'd been beaten down by the specter of death. Her loss is utter and complete at this point because making matters worse in the culture of that day, this woman is now considered destitute. So she lost husband, she lost son, and with that she lost hope. Broke. There's only a couple of directions her life can take now. The breadwinners of her life, her husband and son were both gone, and she was now going to be left to fend for herself. There's no government assistance. There were no social programs. There was no getting on welfare. Or, uh -uh, there, there, there was no food pantry. There was no uh, a woman's shelter for her to go to. With, with the death of her son, the door was open to where she could possibly be condemned to a life of begging. A life no greater than a leper. There's one more clue to the kind of woman this mother was. If you look again and notice at the funeral, a large crowd from the town was with her. The Bible says in Luke 7, 12, much people of the city. In that day, it was not uncommon for rich people to hire mourners for a funeral of a loved one. But this woman's already lost her husband, so it's doubtful that she was rich. And now she's lost her son, too. So she certainly couldn't afford just to simply hire people to show up for her son's burial. But yet a large crowd shows up anyway. Wow. What was in it for them? Nothing, really. Except we can deduce that they really cared for her. This lady mattered to that city. The people of that city did not like seeing her suffer, and they wanted to be there for her. I, I believe that, that, that we can realize here that there was something going on. In fact, in the book of Acts, we're told of a Christian named Tabitha, also called Dorcas. She got sick and died. But she had ministered to so many people in that community that some of the disciples sent for Peter to come to her house. This lady made such an impact. I'm telling you, you can make such an impact. Uh, Peter, uh, we need to get Peter here. I believe they were hoping against hope that Peter might be able to raise the dead as his master Jesus did. Acts 9 and 39, it says, Then Peter rose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber, and all the windows, widows stood by him weeping and showing the coats and the garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. They were praising her. They were showing him the value that she, she, she became so vital to the church. She, she was so important to the body. Everybody, look what she done. When I was going through this, she made this. When I was going that, she brought this. When I, this lady made a difference to the body. There's something about those folks that are all in and recognize who we're going to spend heaven with. Uh, just something about those folks that, that, that they're not all oh, oh, me and mine, and that's it. You're going to find out you'll find yourself marching out the city by yourself. But when you go all in with the body of Christ, there'll be a throng of people. There'll be a whole group of people. Look what they've done. Look how important they are. It ought to be a sad day when you can disappear and you disappear. Hello? 
But Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed and turning him to the body, said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. When she saw Peter, she sat up. Almost a mirror image of what happened with Jesus. So. The Bible tells us Peter went with him when he arrived. He was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around showing him all those things. Peter put them all out. One of these days, the Lord's going to call for the dead in Christ to get up. You know, I'm starting to think that this widow's name was a lot like Tabitha. I'm thinking with all the folks who showed up that this widow gave herself to others in such a powerful way. And I thought the whole town wanted to be there for her. She was such such a great importance. There was nothing selfish about her. There was nothing ungodly about her. There was nothing critical in her spirit. She was just a lady that was there for everybody. That's why everybody was there for her. They wanted to be there in her grief. They wanted to be. They would refuse to allow her to go alone. She was important to them. So if she hurt, they hurt. That's what people do for the special folks in our lives. Those that truly exemplify true Christianity and love, they, they all come out and show honor and support. That's all anyone can really do. Show up and be with the hurting. That's what a funeral is. You place your life on hold. You honor and support someone like that. Well, that is till Jesus showed up. Because when Jesus showed up, that widow of Nain, all Jesus had to do was speak the words and the dead would rise. You, you know, I, I'll be honest with you. I think it'd be not that I want to go to anybody's funeral. Not that I want to even have a funeral. But to be able to go to a funeral. And, hold on, folks. Walk up to the person in the casket and say, arise. <laughs> yeah. You want to talk about a spiritually and gratifying experience, being a person that walks in and raises the dead, boy, that's going to get your attention. Just, 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 well, some of you maybe a little bit, the rest of us a whole lot. I don't know about you, but I'm a, oh, wait a minute now. Homeboy got some skills. <laughs> oh, homegirl got to walk with God. Look at her raising the dead like that. <laughs> Can you imagine being able to give the dead back to the living? You'll get that one later. Hallelujah. Can you imagine restoring life? Can you imagine getting that place where, where what, being once dead, you're now made alive? Oh, I hope you're getting my parallel. I hope someone's understanding what Jesus can do in your life. You can get caught up in the things of this world, in the sins and the trespasses and all that. But you know what? When Jesus walks up, he brings life. There's something that bothers us about death. And it should. I'm going to say something here that I think some of you are not going to realize. Death is natural. Now, I, mean, I hope you haven't, but if you have, when you see a dead body, it's not natural. I, because of what I do and where I've been, I've, 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 I, I had to see dead bodies at an early age in life. I watched, watched a man drown. Just a young boy. It's unnatural to watch a body like that. Death is not easy. We weren't really originally made to die. Genesis 2 and 7, the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. The Bible lets us know we were not created to die. We weren't made to inhabit a grave. It's not natural. It's not the way things should have gone or, or should be. Genesis 2 and 7, says, But the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Never, never supposed to die. Romans 5, 14 says, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who's the figure of him that was to come. 
you have you have the second Adam for those of you. I don't want to get too deep because I know it's a Wednesday night and some won't get this and I don't have time to dig it all out for you. By one man's sin, by one man's sin, verse 12, where boy as one man's sin entered into the world, Adam, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And so because death is unnatural, it creates all kinds of negative emotions. Sorrow, tears, anxiety, panic, fear, resentment, anger, frustration, desperation, confusion. Sometimes hatred. Hatred towards God. I never forget talking to, and this has happened many times, people about the plan of salvation. And when they see the plan of salvation, they look back at someone that's passed away and they say, wait a minute, they didn't do this. Are you telling me? I said, I ain't going to tell you nothing. They're in the hands of a loving God. That's all I'll ever tell you. And I've seen people get mad that God would have a standard. He had a standard to begin with. Nothing's new there. We tried to change it. We manipulated it. We sinned, not God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I don't know about you. But I would love to show up at a funeral, touch the recently dearly departed, and say arise, and watch them sit up as they step out of a casket and walk among the living one more time. But until the Spirit of God directs you and I to interrupt a funeral, we can't do that. So instead, we do what they did. We show up. We just show up. We show up. But when Jesus shows up, when Jesus crosses paths with that solemn procession of mourners, Jesus did what he could, and he had the power to raise the dead. I'm telling you, I know you're in church tonight. Those of you listening a lot, Jesus is walking by with the power to raise the dead. You can be lost in trespasses and sins, but he can raise you out of that into newness of life. But you've got to allow that touch to affect you. Yeah. There's a story told of a little girl who came home from the neighbor's house where her little play, play friend had died. And her mother asked her, hey, where, where, where were you at? Where did you go? I went to see my friend's mommy, said the little girl. Well, what did you go over there to do? I climbed up in her lap and I cried with her. When you and I attend a funeral, those that grieve know don't raise the dead. And there are questions we can't answer. But they want us there anyway. Why? Because our pre presence brings a comfort. It gives them an opportunity to share their sorrow with someone who cares, who understands and can feel what they feel. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, he says, uh, Blessed be God, even the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us all in our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. I can't raise the dead, and you can't raise the dead. Amen. I don't know all the answers about death, and nor do you. But this much I do know. I know the one who gives me comfort. I know the comforter. I know him and he comforts me and I, I share that love and compassion and comfort with others. Let me tell you a fact again, and I've said this before, Jesus never conducted a funeral. Jesus never eulogized anybody. Never preached a funeral. He attended weddings, feasts, average days, synagogues, work days, Sabbath days, but never a funeral. And every time Jesus came near someone who died, they just refused to stay dead. They just, so, so, so let me bring out another fact. And I, uh, Jesus, even invited, didn't visit every funeral. I'm going to try to go quickly here. He didn't even try to get back for Lazarus' funeral. Jesus didn't raise every dead person from the grave. 
by the account that I have, Jesus only raised three times, raised the dead. Here in our text with this, in the city of Nain where he stopped the funeral and raised the widow's son. Later when Jesus encountered Jairus, the, the ruler of the synagogue, and, 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 and raised up the 12-year-old daughter just died. It's kind of interesting when he entered the room where her body was being prepped for burial, he took her by the hand and said, little girl, rise, came back from the dead. And of course, the day Jesus stood before the tomb of Lazarus and called out, Lazarus, come forth. You know, I kind of look at that, and this is some of you guys that, you see, when, you, when he said Lazarus come forth, every Lazarus on the planet Earth could have come forth. But he knew who he was talking about, and the spirit world did too. That's why when you baptize in Jesus' name, it matters, because we all know the Jesus we're talking about. There's no confusion in names there, those that want to confuse the word of God. You see, you have to understand, when he said Lazarus come forth, a man who had been dead four days came out of the grave. Jesus never performed a funeral, but he also didn't visit every tomb. He didn't attend every funeral. Jesus did not raise every dead person from the grave. He could have walked around every graveyard. He could have gone to every tomb. He could have, you know. He could have visited every cemetery in Israel and raised all the people that ever died. Died. Where are you going, Pastor? I'm going to tell you what. Let me tell you. That isn't why Jesus came. He didn't come to raise the naturally dead. Can I let us all in on a secret in the mindset that God wants for us to have? Philippians chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body. You can't make God any bigger than he is. So how do you magnify him in your body? A life lived for him shows people who he is. A life lived for self denies who he is. So now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be of life or by death, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. That's the understanding we need to have in that verse of Scripture. And I'm going to say this. Too many people are stuck on this earth. Oh, you're stuck in this place with worldly mindsets and worldly accomplishments and looking and, for, and connected to human approval and worldly accolades and praises. Too many people are stuck in a mindset that this is all important when it's not. What is the condition of my soul when Jesus walks by? Can I be raised out of the death of trespasses and sins or am I stuck? that he cannot touch me, that when that moment comes, that whether I've lived or died, I can be raised up with him. Too many are focused on stuff and not the Savior, focused on hobbies and not him, focused on goals and not on God. You got to go here. You got to go there. You got to get that done. You're consumed with finishing this and doing that and being known and having accolades and some sort of humanistic pride. Why would Jesus want to raise people from the dead to only have them die again? Why would God give you more time to do more things for the planet and for hobbies and, and not what? You know what he was giving this widow? Just a temporary fix to the problem of death. Because even though Jesus brought this man Lazarus and Jairus' daughter back to life. Even if they all outlived their parents, they were all going to die all over again. After living on the wheel of the human rat race, death is a painful reality of life and we're all going to die. Being raised from the dead has its merits. But other than momentarily shouting right, why would I want to be brought back to life to only die again? I've read stories. 
people who've died, and I've had an experience myself on the operating table. There are stories of people have stopped breathing, or heart has stopped, they've been pronounced dead, but something called them back to this life. You'll find that most of them speak of seeing a great light or feeling at peace or sensing the presence of God. And many of them share the same emotion. But you know what? They also have that sense of deep disappointment. They don't want to come back here. They don't want to come. It it blows my mind that we get here and live so much that we don't want to be ready to go there. But yet when you talk to people that have had that out of body, they don't want to come back here. That lets us know there's something missing. Our natural flesh will deceive us. Our arrogance and our pride and our ego of human success makes all of a sudden she's so anchored to this that we might just miss that. You see, Jesus didn't come to give us a temporary reprieve from death. He didn't come so that we go through an earthly death over and over and over again. Why would we want him to do that anyway? He didn't come to give us anything temporary, no temporary reprieve. Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Hebrews 9.27, at his point in the man wants to die, but after this, the judgment. There's a judgment coming. Don't, don't think it's not, but be ready for it. But again, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Oh, I want to be a part of the body of Christ. Oh, I want to make my calling and my election sure. I want to make sure I have severed anything and everything that might just be tying me. I'll never forget President Reagan in his speech about after the space shuttle. And they cut and severed the surly bonds of this earth uh, to touch the face of God. There ought to be something about it. I'm going to occupy till he comes, but I'm more focusing on when he comes. Uh, John 6 and 40, and this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believes on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at that last day. Let's all stand. You see, That's the promise God gives every born-again Christian. Listen, if you're only born once, you'll die twice. If you're born twice, you'll die once. You must be born again. I'm telling you, if you you do any, I don't care if I don't care if you begin on, you make it on the Fortune 500. I don't care if you make it on the cover of Vogue. I don't care if you make it on the cover of 16 Teenage Man. I don't give a flying flip if you end up the, with the likes of Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, and anybody else up there. It ain't gonna mean nothing. I wonder what Steve Jobs would say if we could just pull him out of eternal death and let him walk in here and tell us how important what he did was. Jesus didn't come to extend or raise you from natural death, but he did come to save him spiritually eternal death. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except, for unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say that except a man be born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say that ye must be born again. I, I, I believe Jesus uh, has the right to put the rules. Whether we like it or not, he, he has set the standard. He, 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 he has made the way. There, there's something about it. And the Bible lets us know that once you do that, you better stay living for God unless someone steal your crown. You stop carrying your cross. I'm, I'm going to tell you, so God will find someone uh, out of the hedges, the highways, or the byway that'll come up and take up your cross that you didn't want, and they'll carry it all the way to a crown. Eleven twenty-five of John. John said unto her, "I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live." 
Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live to new life. You see, when someone realizes they need to ask God for forgiveness, that's called repentance. I want to live a repentant life. I, I, I'm going to tell you something. You can pray a lot of great prayers, but I'm going to tell you the most important prayer you ever pray is your own personal prayer of repentance every day. The smartest thing I ever figured out, Sister Carol, was when I get up in the morning, is to repent. When I lay my head down, and you, hey, I, I, I'm going to tell you something. God... Forgive me. Forgive me. I, I was a little selfish today, God. I I, I, really, I didn't get out there and I didn't do this and I didn't and I probably could have done and I probably could have read that. And I, I want to live a life for repentance. I never want to get so caught up in this world that I am not touched. I can't imagine being an apostolic Pentecostal service and not feeling the presence of God. I can't imagine being in a, in, in a church that believes in the power of God every speaking to other tongues that you would be here without speaking in another tongue. I can't imagine what an affront that'll be when the last trumpet sounds and you're like the five foolish and you're empty. You see, too many people are being buried alive. Mm -hmm. You see, we baptize someone, we put them under the water, we will water the grave, we bury them. And in that action, God teaches us that all our sins in our past have died and been buried, but we don't leave a person in a watery grave. We bring them back up again to new life in Christ. Amen. Sins are washed away. Saint rises up out of a water grave to go walk and live in a way never done before. They turn their back on sin and turn their back on the flesh. Turn their back on the weights and the foolishness of the things of this world. And it's in that action and that obedience that God teaches us that the earthly grave will not hold us. Amen. Amen. That earthly, oh, that's that. That's where we get. Oh, I may not like a funeral, but I don't want to be afraid of mine. That he will raise us up on that last day. And when he, he raise, raises up the dead on that last day, it won't be to die all over again. Paul wrote an amazing, awesome note to us. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. But we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed, for this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written. Are you ready? Death is swallowed up yes. in victory. Amen. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? We're not afraid of funerals. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not, why are you living for God like that? Because it's not in vain. Why are you faithful to the house of God? Because it's not in vain. Why are you faithful to prayer? Why are you doing outreach? Why are you loving souls? Why are you so tenacious about the church? Because it's the only thing I can do that's not vanity and vexation of the spirit. Mm. Years ago, there was a professional golfer. But the Joe, he was only 33 years old. He had won the PGA championship and had 10 tournament victories to his credit. But he was diagnosed with cancer. He wrote, a genuine feeling of fear came over me. I could die from cancer. Then another reality hit me even harder. I'm going to die eventually anyway, whether from cancer or something else. It's just a question of when. Everything I had accomplished in golf became absolutely meaningless to me. All I wanted to do was live. Then a friend 
who had been teaching a Bible study on the tour and was aware of what he was experiencing, said to him, we are not in the land of the living going to the land of the dying. We are in the land of the dying trying to go to the land of the living. Yeah, you ought to praise God. If, you, if I need to say it again, I'll say it. You need to get a hold of that. We are not in the land of the living going to the land of the dying. We are in the land of the dying going to the eternal land of the living. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, death. Where is that sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? Oh, thanks be to God. I don't know about you. You can give a lot of things praise, and you can be already thinking about what you're going to do tomorrow. But I can tell you what you do right now. You can lift up your hands and give glory to the God that will take you to the land of the living. He'll redeem you to the land of the living. He's coming to take you to the land. I wonder if we can lift up our hands and praise him. Lift up our hands. If you haven't spoken tongues in a while, now's the time. If you haven't prayed through, this is a great moment 